I want to read to you from John's Gospel, the 14th chapter. These are the words of Jesus, beginning verse 1. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way where I'm going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. That statement that Jesus made, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Most of us have probably heard that numerous times. I want to talk to you about that this morning. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And I'm just going to deal with them in reverse order. Jesus is the life, he's the truth, and he's the way. When he said, I am the life, it's the Greek word zoe. It means the God kind of life. Life as God has it. It's also translated as eternal life. And that is why Jesus came. John 10.10 10 said, The thief comes but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Zoe, the life of God and all of its implications, that's why Jesus came. And you know, in John 17, 3, he actually defined what this life is all about. John 17, 3, he said, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. At its core, it is about relationship. That this eternal life, at its core, it's about knowing the Father and knowing the Son. And the word know there literally means and speaks of the most intimate possible relationship. This is eternal life, that they might know you, that they might have an intimate, personal relationship with you, Father, and with me, your Son. And that is mankind's greatest need. You know, we go back to the garden and we see why. God makes this beautiful creation, creates man and woman in his own image, in his own likeness. It says, have dominion over it. It's yours. Enjoy it. However, everyone say however. <laughs> however, there's one thing that I claim exclusive right to. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you touch that, the, the day you partake of that, if you make that choice, that day you'll die. God is saying, I alone decide what's good and evil, what's right and wrong, what's sin and what's not sin. There are God guide rails. There are absolutes. And God's saying, I sent them. But if you ever try and take that onto yourself, the day you do it, you'll die. And we know, reading in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve decided they wanted to be like God themselves, deciding right and wrong, good and evil. I mean, who says that I have to live within these guardrails that God has set? You know, who, who says he has to be the final authority? I can decide for myself what's right and what's wrong, what's sin, what's not. I mean, maybe what's sin for that person, I don't consider it a sin. You know, maybe what's wrong for them is not wrong for me. There are not absolutes. I'll decide for myself. And they partook of that tree. And God said, the day you do it, you'll die. But if you read, they actually didn't die that day. They lived for a long time after that. So, did God get it wrong? I hope you're listening out on the plaza there. Did God get it wrong? No, actually he didn't. In the, the Hebrew, in the original text, the word die there is twice. God said, if you ever violate this one thing, you will die, die. You'll die a double death. They did die that day. They died spiritually. That doesn't mean to cease to exist. It means to be cut off from God, severed from a relationship with God. That is spiritual death. And as a result of that, they died the second death, the physical death, many years later. And that profoundly affects all of us. Adam and Eve were the fountainheads of the human race. And Romans 5 and 12 says, when Adam sinned, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, 
So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. This state of spiritual death has been spread to the entire human race. And every person intuitively senses that something is missing, that there, there's something wrong, there, there's something that, that, that I need, and we try and fill that empty place with everything in the world. Some people try and fill it with mind-bending, mind-altering drugs. Some people try and fill that empty place with excessive you know, drinking of alcohol. Some try and fill it with sex and relationships. They run from man to man or from woman to woman, but it never fills the empty place. My friend, that's a God-shaped hole. Can only be filled through a relationship with him. Some try and fill it with money and things. If I can just get more stuff, if I can just make more money, I'll be happy. That, that'll fill the empty place. It never can fill it. Some try and fill it with nature. They become lovers of nature, even worshipers of nature. Some try and fill the empty place with art and literature, but it will not fill it. Some try and fill it with sports. Some even try and fill it with religious ritual and ceremony. You know, when I was a new Christian, I was living down in Mexico. I was camping by a beach one day. The sun had set, I started a fire, I'm cooking some beans on the fire. And out of the shadows comes this guy. He, he's a homeless guy and he's got his dog with him. So I asked him if he's hungry. He said, yeah, he sat down, I fed him and his dog the beans. And sitting by the fire, I said, can I read something to you? And I pulled out a track by T.L. Osborne called Salvacion o Religion, Salvation or Religion. It was a really, really long track. And I read the whole thing to him, both sides. It took me about eight or nine minutes to read it. I put the track down, I looked up. He's sitting across the fire and there's tears streaming down his face. I ended up leading him in a salvation prayer and he received Christ there at my fire. Uh, that, that whole track dealt with the fact that people try and substitute religious ritual for relationship. Remember, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they might know you, have relationship with you. And, and he realized that, that he had tried to do that. He was brought up in an environment and in a culture that, that, that had a whole lot of ceremony and regulations and rituals, but no relationship. I'm gonna read on to you there in Romans chapter five, verse 18. It says, yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and new life for everyone. Verse 21, so just as sin ruled over all people and brought them to death, now God's wonderful grace rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Only through embracing Jesus Christ and putting your trust in him is that empty place filled. There's no other way. He is the life. And when you embrace Jesus and put your trust in him as your Lord and Savior, it brings you eternal life now and it brings you heaven in the future. John put it very succinctly, 1 John 5 and 12. He said, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. And again, what is life? A relationship with God. All right, Jesus said, I'm the life. He also said, I'm the truth. You cannot enjoy the life of Jesus if you reject the truth of Jesus. Jesus said this, John 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to those who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus' truth is the word of God. It is the scriptures. You know, in John 1 and 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In the beginning, the word was with God. And the word with there literally means facing. It's speaking of the preexistence of Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was facing God, and the word was God. 
Jesus pre-existed with the Father. They had a face-to-face relationship. In verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. Now listen to this. The psalmist said this, Psalm 138, verse 2. I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. Lord, you've magnified your word above all your name. If you claim to be following the one named Jesus, but won't accept his word as your final authority, something is amiss. He has magnified his word above his name. The psalmist also said, Psalm 119, verse 128, therefore, all your precepts concerning all things I consider to be right, and I hate every false way. All your precepts, your word concerning everything I consider to be right, concerning everything, concerning money, I consider what you say about money and how it should be handled, what should be done with it, it's right about marriage, it's right. About relationships, it's right. About forgiveness, it's right. About work, it's right. About rest, it's right. I consider all of your precepts, all of your work concerning all things to be right. It is my final authority on all matters of conscience and living. You know, I've I've shared this story before, but it illustrates the point well. I had a guy I was an assistant pastor for a couple of years in a, a church out on the way to Palm Springs in a little town called Beaumont. And a guy that was attending the church rang me up, says, Bayless, can I come and talk to you? I got, I got an issue. I said, sure. So he comes to the apartment where Jan and I were living and I had just been reading in one of the gospels, one of the, the parables that Jesus had, had taught and I'd just been pouring over it and then there's a knock at the apartment door. I let him in and he goes on and tells me about this issue he's got at work and he's really upset about some stuff that's been going on at work and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh. This is the, everything he said, on the, some of the words he used were in the parable that I just read that Jesus said. Everything he said is in the parable. I said, I, you're not gonna believe this. I was just reading this. And I, look, I put the Bible in front of him and we read through the parable to a certain point. He says, oh my gosh. He said, that's exactly what's going on at work. Man, that, that's just what I said. I, he said, that's amazing. I said, it gets better. <laughs> I said, let's read a little farther. This is what Jesus said you should do. And then we read it. He said, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I said, that's what Jesus said you're supposed to do when, when this is what happens to you. He got up. He said, I didn't come over here to listen to that went out, slammed the door, jumped on his motorcycle, drove out of the parking lot at about 80 miles an hour. Friend, you cannot enjoy the life of Jesus if you reject the truth of Jesus. By contrast, just a few weeks ago, I was doing meetings in in Europe and uh, did some preaching in in the Netherlands. There was a young man that was coming to the meeting and I knew ahead of time he had contacted us. He had been a drug addict and had a lot of issues, got saved through watching the broadcast. And God has turned his life around. He's basically now an evangelist and he's written a book to help other addicts. He's written this brilliant book and just really well put together and he wanted to come in and meet with me. I had never met him before, before the service and just, just talk about what had been done and he, he, he said this as well. I mean, I knew it was coming. He said, you know, um, <clears throat> my girlfriend and I, says, we, we've been together 17 years and we, we've got three kids together. He says, but after I got saved, started serving the Lord, I, I'm listening to one of your, your broadcasts about marriage and about sex. And you showed from the scriptures that, that sex by God is designed to be between a man and a woman within the context of marriage. He says, I realize we did the whole thing backwards. We're not married. He said, so my girlfriend and I, we decided we're gonna abstain from sex until we get officially married. 
And so they come to the meeting. I, I'm with them in the green room before I'm going to go out and preach. And they were just lovely. They got their three little kids with them there. And I knew it was coming. He gets down on one knee, pulls a little box out, opens it up. There's a ring and he proposes to his girlfriend there. And she said, yes, of course. And we all got on our knees together, the kids, them. I laid hands on them and we prayed together. It was really a sacred moment. Now, some people say, well, that's extreme. I mean, what the heck? They've been living together for 17 years. They've already got three kids. That's extreme. Now they're not going to have sex till they get married. That's not extreme. That is the normal response of a heart that has received the life of Jesus. That his truth becomes my final authority. And I'm not going to adjust his truth to fit my life. I'm going to adjust my life to fit his truth. Jesus said this, John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word. And my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. My friend, there is great blessing in embracing and obeying his truth. There's great blessing in it. You know, I had a friend, he's been in heaven many years now. He was a tad older than me. He was in the church, his kids were in the church, his wife, his family, and the kids were probably maybe three years or so younger than me. So he was a little bit older. And I will tell you, he was probably one of the kindest, most tender-hearted, generous people I have ever met in my life. Kindness just oozed out of this guy. Everything he said, everything he did, and I watched him just, just display this kindness and generosity to people over and over and over. So this guy, you just want to be around someone like him. I was surprised when the kids told me, he says, you know, Pastor, we lived in terror of him growing up our whole lives. He said, if, if you just did something he didn't like, he would explode and he would scream and cuss at you and would have violent outbursts and, and we would get hit. Says he, he was just a powder keg waiting to go off. Says we'd be driving, you know, the family's in the car and somebody accidentally would, would go over into his lane. He would force them off the road. Now the whole family's in the car. Go over, jerk open the other guy's door, pull the other guy out in front of his family that's in the car and beat him senseless and leave him almost unconscious on the side of the road, get back in the car with our family, and we'd drive off, and we'd be sitting there. Nobody would say a word, said we were absolutely terrified of him. He told me once, he said, Pastor, you know, I had a, a business partner that double-crossed me. He says, I asked around, and I found a hit man. And I hired a man to murder him. So when I went to meet with the hitman, I had the money with me. And at the last minute I pulled out says, because I knew they would trace it back to me and I didn't want to go to prison. He said, it was the only reason I didn't have that man murdered. He said, my heart was filled with violence and murder and unforgiveness and bitterness. But he heard the gospel he embraced the life of Jesus, but he also embraced the truth of Jesus. Where Jesus said, to do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Bless those who curse you. And the scripture says, forgive others even as you've been forgiven by God in Christ. And the family, they told me, says, it changed our whole world. It changed everything. It brought peace into a home that was filled with terror and uneasiness. It brought reconciliation between the family members. It's changed our whole lives. It's changed the lives of the grand. It's changed everything. When he embraced Jesus and started doing life according to Jesus' truth. Basically, here it is. I can't come to Jesus and say, and say to him, I want eternal life, Jesus, and all of the benefits it brings, but don't tell me what to do or not to do. I've got my own ideas about what's right and wrong. 
Sounds like Adam and Eve in the garden, doesn't it? Lord, I, I want eternal life, but don't tell me what to do with my money. Don't tell me how to express my sexuality. I'll decide that for myself. And by the way, Jesus, I don't agree with all the stuff you say about sin and judgment and hell and the, the exclusivity of the cross, but I, I want eternal life, but I'm not, I'm not in for all this other. It just doesn't work that way, my friend. Amen. Here's something good to remember. This is 1 John 2 and 4. It says, if someone claims, I've come to know God by experience, yet does not keep God's commands, he's a phony, and the truth finds no place in him. And that doesn't mean that a believer will never sin. It doesn't mean that we'll never struggle against temptation. But it, it, it does mean that one that rejects the truth of Jesus obviously does not share in his life. And again, I just want to emphasize to you, there is great blessing and great benefit in embracing and obeying the truth of Jesus, whether it has to do with promises or prohibitions. He is the life, but he's also the truth. They go together. You can't have one and reject the other. And then, thirdly, Jesus said, I am the way. The way. And when we think about the way, first of all, we think about direction. And of course, as we read those verses in John 14, he said, I'm the way. No one comes to the Father but by me. All right, it's talking about a, a direction, coming to the Father. It's very exclusive. There's only one way into a relationship with the Creator, with the Heavenly Father, and that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus said this in Matthew 7. You guys are listening very well, by the way. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. It's narrow because Jesus is it. There is no other way to the Father. Jesus is it, and some find it difficult because of the guardrails of truth on either side. They don't want to live within the parameters that God sets. But the thing still holds true, just like God told Adam in the garden, look, it's one thing. I claim exclusive right to. And we need to live within those absolutes. But truly, the only way into the Father's family is through Jesus. Jesus, who is the life and who's the truth. But you know, as well as referring to direction, when we speak about a way, it can also mean method. Jesus is the way we need to learn about his method. I think we know very little about the way of Jesus. We know something about the life of Jesus and about the truth of Jesus, but the way of Jesus. His way is personal, it is relational, and it is unhurried. His way is personal, it is relational, and it is unhurried. Jesus was never in a hurry. He had time for people, and he was content to minister wherever he was. We tend to be program-oriented. Jesus was people-oriented. Yes. We tend to be transactional when it comes to our relationships with people. But Jesus was all about the relationship when it came to interactions with people. You know, even though he spoke to large crowds, we find him time after time after time lingering with people, talking with people, sharing meals with people. He never seemed to be in a hurry, though no one in the history of the world had more to do than he did. You know, even think about it. He's raised in, you know, the home of Mary and his stepfather, Joseph, we assume Joseph was a carpenter. Some say that the, those words actually refer to, to being a, a layer of tiles, a, a, you know, a person that would do mosaics. But here's Jesus. He, he knows he's the son of God. 
I mean, he knows that at a very young age. All right, Jesus, you're 20 years old. There's lepers that need to be healed. Get out there in ministry. What are you doing? He's 21. Jesus, there's people that need to hear you preach. Come on, get out. He's, you're 23. What are you waiting for? Come on. Think about all of the sick, you know, in Israel. Think about all of the poor people that need to hear you preach. He just keeps working. His dad's business. He's 25. He's 26. He's 20. Jesus, what do you want? Do you know, Jesus, there are people that are going to die and never hear you preach unless you go out and start preaching now. Think about those people. What are you doing? He's 28. He's 29. Finally, at 30 years of age, he enters ministry. And then even though he works hard, he does not rush around. He has time for individuals, has time to train the 12 disciples. You know, even after the resurrection, he meets two disciples leaving Jerusalem. Their, their eyes are veiled. They don't realize it's him. And he walks with them seven miles to a village called Emmaus. He this is after the resurrection. He walks with them for hours talking to them, asking questions, listening to them. And then he goes into their house to sit down and eat with them. Jesus, what's going on? I mean, you've been raised from the dead. The work is finished and you got hours to talk to these two guys? You know, by contrast, the pace of many that I know in ministry, and I know a lot of men and women in ministry around the world, this is their pace. Build, build, build. Go, go, go. Don't stop. No time. Take your work home with you. Don't have time for friendships. Don't have time for the kids. Go, go, go. Build, build, build. The world's, world's going to hell. Come on. No wonder people are burned out. No wonder they're fatigued. You know, God is never in a hurry. But most of the people that I know, whether they're in ministry or, you know, working at whatever, they, they are in a hurry. Most everyone I know. You know, Adam in the, the garden, we spoke about it. He and Eve sin fetched the whole human race. All right, God sees, he's got a mess on his hands. He says, I'm gonna fix this. And so he does. He sends a savior 4,000 years later. And then that Savior, his son, dies on the cross for the sins of humanity 2,000 years ago. And God still has not wrapped this thing up. Yes. Listen to the words of Jesus, Matthew 11. We're talking about the way, the method of Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, if you were here last Wednesday night, we had a great service, and um, Pastor Garrett shared a great message and, and did it in a very unique way. But he read that verse to us, or, or had us read it from the, the Message Bible, which is a, a paraphrase, basically tries to get across the meaning of what's being said. Listen to this, this, these same words of Jesus from the Message. Jesus asked, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Yes. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. I got a word for you, those that are listening. Actually, two words. Slow down. Yes. Slow down. I guarantee you, you will not be 
laying upon your deathbed wishing you'd spent more time at the office. Amen. Not gonna happen. You know, years ago we were having our house tented for termites and I realized I'd forgotten, I'd promised Spencer, our youngest son, he was a little boy, to take him fishing and I'd forgotten about the fishing poles in the garage. So they've tended the whole house. I go to the guy and say, man, can I get in the garage real quick? He said, what, what do you need in the garage? He said, I forgot fishing poles. I promised to take my son fishing. And this guy really sarcastically said, oh yeah, it must be nice. And it kind of hacked me off. And I, I wheeled on, I said, listen, me taking my son fishing, it's not a luxury, it's a necessity. And that guy hung his head and said, you know what, man, you're right. He said, I miss my kid's childhood. They're all grown now and we're not close. I missed them growing up because I was always so consumed with work. He said, yeah, you can go in the garage and get the fishing poles and have fun. I was on a fishing trip once down in the Sea of Cortez in Mexico with some friends and there's a whole bunch of people on this boat. We're on the boat for a week. And there's this one guy and, and you know, he's putting on this front of being sort of a tough guy. You know, I mean, he's got his armor on all the time and he's, you know, he's just trying to really exude this, this aura of being a man's man. And he had his boy with him on the trip, which I thought was cool. But anyway, he was lay, leaning over the, the railing one day and he was by himself. I walked up to him, I said, hey, I just want to tell you, I think it's really cool that you brought your boy. I said, he's never gonna forget this. I said, you're being a great dad. This is gonna impact his life and I, I just wanted to commend you for sowing this time with your boy. And he started to cry. The armor all fell off. He's got tears in his eyes. He said, you know, he said, my old man never had time for me. He was always chasing the almighty dollar. And all of a sudden he realized that his armor had fallen off. And then he's crying and he just turned around, <laughs> made a beeline for the other side of the boat to get away from me. But here he is into adulthood, carrying these deep wounds because daddy was so busy with everything else. You may have heard me talk about this before, but it's a, a well-known preacher. You, you may know who it is, but uh, he actually was sent to prison, spent four, maybe almost five years, I think, in prison for you know, breaking some laws. And about his fourth year in, um, his son turned 18, was allowed to come in without a chaperone and visit his father in the prison, minimum security prison. And I heard the this, this, this story about it because when he got out, he, in a, he was invited to come speak to a group of ministers. And a friend of mine was in the meeting and he told me about it. And he told me this is what the guy said. So anyway, his son comes in that, that day. They spend the whole day in the prison walking around the prison yard, eating prison food, you know, going into the shop um, the entire day. At the end of the day, when his son's gonna leave, he said, Dad, I just wanna tell you, this has been the greatest day of my life. His father said, what are you talking about? You spent the day with me in prison. He said, no, Dad, this is the greatest day of my life. He says, always before, you were so busy, and you never had time for me. He says, and I realize the ministry is important, but you're always in a meeting with this person and that person, or you're rushing here, you're rushing there. And all I ever wanted my whole life was a whole day with you. And today I had you for the whole day to myself. It's been the greatest day of my life. And he turned as he's sharing the story to those ministers. He said, I had to go to prison to give my son a day of my life. Solomon said, they made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Some of you need to slow down. Jesus' way is something we must learn. Jesus' truth is something we must embrace and obey. And Jesus' life is something we must receive by faith. The Bible says, by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We can't earn it, we can't merit it. God's hand of grace is reaching out and offering eternal life. It's a relationship with God. But, but with that, you need to understand, not just Jesus' life, but with it comes his truth. You know, the Bible says, if you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead and confess him with your mouth as? 
Lord, you'll be saved. Lord means boss. Lord means final authority. It can't be, well, Jesus, I want eternal life, but don't touch my sexuality. Don't touch my money. And all this other stuff you say about these things that are politically incorrect and go cross grain of society, well, I, I just, you know, I don't accept. It doesn't work that way, friend. It's either all in or not in at all. And I'm gonna ask you, you know, Jesus said the one that comes to me, I won't turn away. Doesn't matter how, how dark your past is. Maybe you're a lot like my friend that I described that terrorized his family and was filled with hatred and bitterness. Jesus changed all of that and he'll change it for you. You know, we look at all the problems in the world and I think we, maybe you're asking the wrong question. Our, our question is like, what can we do? Well, that's not a bad question, but a better question is what can God do? And then we wait on him to see how he wants to use us. And we pray for him to move because the truth is the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And Jesus is the only one that can fix the heart. He loves you. Out on the plaza, I hope you're listening to, to me and wherever you might be right now. You just need to know you're loved by God. He offers eternal life, relationship, salvation, brings you life now, brings heaven and the, the hereafter. But there are guardrails. Yeah. The way is narrow. Some people find that really difficult. It is. Jesus said it would be. But again, it's all in or not in at all. You gotta make a choice. Just bow your heads, close your eyes. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace that reaches us when we're at our worst and helps us to not rely on ourselves when we're at our best. We love you. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Real quickly, all across the auditorium, if you've come in here today and you know you need a relationship with God, you need to be changed from the inside out, you want to know that your sins are forgiven, well, if you'll come to him, he'll embrace you, and I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. But I'd like to pray for any backsliders here today. You at one time maybe had a pretty hot fire going for God, but Today you look around and there's just a few embers that threaten to go out. Maybe you started hanging around with some of your old crew and got back into some of your old patterns of living and just little by little you've drifted away from God. Maybe someone that you looked up to, that you trusted, maybe someone that impacted your life as a young Christian. Maybe they screwed up, maybe they betrayed you and that somehow became a wedge between you and God. Well, friend, you need to keep your eyes on Jesus. Every human being has the potential of messing up, you included, me included. We need to keep our eyes on him. But whatever the reason, if you're away from him, but you loved him as a child or as a young person, listen, it's time to come home, prodigal. God's not mad at you, but it's time to come home and to come with all you've got. As I look around the auditorium here, I'm gonna ask out on the plaza as well and, and maybe anywhere else. No, nobody's looking around but me right now. I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer. In just a moment, we're all gonna pray together and I'll give you the words to pray. But I, I'd like you to do something. If you know you need to pray this prayer, to make your peace with God, to, to have your, your life washed clean from sin and to be made right with God, I'm gonna ask you, I'm just gonna to count to three to just lift your hand when I do that. And I ask you that, not because you have to lift your hand, obviously you don't, but I believe an act that simple can help your faith begin to move toward God because the scripture says faith is expressed through action. Think of it this way, your heart's reaching up to God, you need his help, your hand being raised is just an outward reflection of what's going on in your heart. I'll acknowledge any hands that are up and on the plaza as well, I'd encourage you to put it up. Even if you're watching me on television or listen to this somewhere, I'd encourage you, just put your hand up. One, you ready? It's your day, friend. Two, here we go, three. All across the auditorium, just put them up high. 
Serious business, sacred business right now. A lot of hands all over the auditorium. All right, it's awesome. Go ahead and put them down. Everybody put a hand on your heart right now. Would you pray with me? Just say, oh God, I come to you. With all of my heart, I believe. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died on the cross for me. I believe he was raised from the dead. Jesus, thank you for loving me so much that you would take my place, be my substitute, and pay for my sins. I put my trust in you, Jesus, and I confess you as the Lord of my life. From this moment forward, I'm all in. My life is yours. Amen.